I mean, it was okay. I didn't get to really go outside of London, which is kind of, I wanted to see like the countryside, but yeah. didn't have time for that. I feel the same way. Like I, you know, have, I guess, roots in, in France and I would want to go visit Paris, but what I really want to see is all like the little provincial towns yeah. outside of Paris. All the cool you know? little nooks and crannies. Yeah. You know, I'm not really interested in, I mean, I do want to see things like Champs-Élysées and Eiffel Tower and all that touristy crap, but I'd like to get that over within a couple of days and then just kind of explore the countryside. Yeah, exactly. Via train, you know, get on that train that oh, goes all the way down to, take, to Italy. Yeah, I'd love to take a train that like just goes through everything. And if I were to do that, I would bring along the best travel camera that I could possibly get my hands on and I would buy it from Kometa Camera. Oh, would you now? I would. Is that because we get a discount? Uh, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I'm also encouraging our listeners to do so. Our listeners who are right now listening to our podcast called Camera Academy. How you doing, everybody? Hello. Today on Camera Academy, featuring uh, me, Nick, and Nikolai over here. You, Nick, and Nikolai? We are going to discuss composition techniques. Ooh. We've gone over quite a few different topics, uh, kind of the basics of photography, ranging from uh, aperture and ISO and all the various other parts of the exposure triangle. And, yeah. Uh, a few other things that we've uh, come across, but we're starting to run low on ideas, so we're starting to get into more in-depth things. Yeah, I mean, composition is something you really should be aware of, like, all the time when you're shooting, so. Yeah, well, no doubt it's important. Um, but it's sort of, it's not one of those little things that you got to pick up right at the beginning. Composition is something that really requires a lot of practice and skill. And, um, but fortunately there are some techniques, which we'll go over that can help you in that endeavor. Technique. Techniques. Technique. Um, but before we get into that, let's just, uh, go over the plugs. Check out Cometa.com if you want to buy any cameras or camera accessories. Uh, propane and propane accessories, Bobby. <laughs> camera and camera, camera accessories. accessories. God. Dang it, Bobby. <laughs> um, and then if you want to uh, follow us on social media, of course, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, and uh, you would just search for Cometa Camera on all those things. That's C-A-M-E-T-A, and uh, you should be able to find us pretty easily. Yes. Oh, and we're on YouTube, too. We are. We do that, too. Yep, we do. So, Well, we'll put these things on YouTube, and we'll also do some camera overviews and reviews of various uh, accessories and little pieces of equipment and some how-tos and DIYs and things like that. Just in case you need that little technical support. Yeah. So it's not going to be something that uh, you're going to see us, uh, you know, a video pop up every day. We're not really making money off our YouTube channel, but every now and then something helpful may just come up. Mm -hmm. So check it out. And uh, in the meantime, subscribe to our podcast, which you're listening to. If you haven't already subscribed, subscribe to it on uh, iTunes and uh Let's get started. Let's talk about some composition techniques. All right. The first of which, the one that uh, everyone pretty much knows about because they put a damn grid right on your viewfinder. <laughs> which one is that, Nikolai? That would be the rule of thirds, which is gets buried into every photographer's skull if you go to school for it. And even if you don't know the rule of thirds, for a lot of people who are artistically inclined, it, it seems to be something that's innate, that's sort of yeah. within them. I mean, it's like it's built into your phones, too. So, <laughs> Well, yeah, that does help. <laughs> um, but basically what the rule of thirds is, if you haven't seen it sort of depicted on in, your smartphone, on or, your smartphone or on your camera or just, you know, out, out there on the Google machine, um, imagine your frame. Uh, being divided up by two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. Mm -hmm. And where those lines intersect is basically where you want to put your areas of interest, your subject eyes, for example. Yes. Um, anything that you want the uh, viewer to focus on. And by doing that in terms of thirds rather than having things straight down the middle or whatever, it makes things feel more natural. Um, especially when you have people in the frame and you need them to sort of direct their attention in one direction or the other. Absolutely. Yeah, your eyes for some, I don't know the psychology behind it, but they don't usually go for dead center on things because it's kind of a strain. You kind of want to put your main areas of focus a little off center. Mm -hmm. Well, having things sort of right down the middle doesn't really feel natural, so no. to speak. So having things a little off center um, does help make your pictures seem more natural. And again, if you have people in the picture, uh, they're usually looking in one direction or the other. Very rarely do people look directly at the camera, you know, with their face facing 
forward directly at the camera, unless that's something you're going for. That's something I kind of go for with my portraits, but okay. <laughs> no, it, it's fine, but it's usually not. It's it's usually not what you see when you look at a yeah a, a portrait. If but you, if, again, you don't it, you don't get your school portraits done with uh, you facing directly towards the camera, yeah, looking exactly. down the barrel of the lens. And not only that, it's like you can't really put someone's eyes directly in the center of an image. Yeah, I mean you can, but that's. That's an artistic choice. Yeah, I but guess. But generally speaking, the reason that the rule of thirds works is because it just works. It's, you know, it makes the image feel things. natural. It's one of those things that sort of looks good to everybody. So if you've got a portrait and you situate their eyes uh, one third down and one third from either side and looking into the negative space, it sort of just feels right and it works and it everything becomes framed the way that uh, it naturally just feels normal and Good. Uh, like the be like the best example for that. What was that board game, where it's like the bald guy and he's like like the name of the board game is on the top of the box and okay. like all you see is half his head and look he's looking up at the name of the the game. Oh boy. Was that noggin? Was that? This is uh, out of my realm of expertise. I'm just it's it's an older game. Hmm. It's like a like a like a party game. Don't know. I forgot what it was called. Okay. Let us know in the comments. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, what you're saying is that uh, he looks... It visually works. Like it's some, It's an image I have, like I can remember in my head. So um, keep in mind the uh, lines on your screen. If your camera doesn't actually have them built in, like, you know, you can always just attempt to imagine them, I suppose. Yeah. But lots of cameras do have the ability to sort of uh, superimpose a little rule of thirds grid over the LCD screen or your electronic viewfinder. And uh, it is helpful sometimes when you're framing up your shots and you really want to make sure that you get it right in camera. It's yep. helpful to have one of those things superimposed. And I guess you could always just like take a, a grease pencil or a crayon or something <laughs> and write on your LCD screen. Like I screen. said, I'm pretty sure that iPhones and Androids have that as an option yeah. for their cameras. Yes, I usually see that, although we wouldn't encourage people necessarily to shoot with their smartphones. Eh, you know what? Don't don't do it. If you have don't, it, don't do it. No, I know. I'm just Somet saying. Sometimes it's uh, what's that? What's that expression? It's the camera that you have in your bag is the most important piece of gear you could have. It it's true. Yeah, it is true. But even so, uh, buy a real camera from us. Yes. And then use that if you want to get super serious about <laughs> it. Um, one other good thing about rule of thirds is that uh, you can shoot sort of with extra space in mind, and then keep uh, and then you can crop things. And with Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever other uh, software you're using to crop, you can usually find a rule of thirds guide when, oh, you're yeah. when you're actually doing the cropping, and you can get it more accurate. So that way, you get that you get that really th that positioning really perfect. Yeah, it definitely comes in handy a lot, and I definitely do a lot of cropping pros process. Yeah. So uh, that's it. That's the rule of thirds. Not much else to say about it. Just uh, keep your subjects and even like landscape photography. Um, street photography, things like that. Keep your subjects of interest on one of those third lines or at an intersecting points, and it sort of just, it just works. Yeah, it just and we're, we're, we're basically really just kind of describing what the rule of thirds is. We're not going, like, in depth. Like, when I was in college, like, we spent classes and classes on the rule of thirds and, yeah. like, different techniques and different ways to use it. Um, the best thing I can say without visual examples is just look up rule of thirds on YouTube or something like that. And I guarantee you out there's professional photographers that have given their own takes and give you kind of like a little lesson on it. Yeah. Or you could just, you know, hit up the old Google machine and you'll, yeah. you'll pull up a bunch of thumbnails right away that'll just show you what we're talking about. Yeah. But if, again, if you want to get more in depth mm -hmm. with it, because it's something that you really should have, again, buried in your skull. Yeah. Well, after a while, it just becomes second nature. Yeah. And those are the things that you just, you compose your images with that in mind, but not actually uh, having some kind of guide. You just exactly, think yeah. about things in, in the terms of thirds. But yeah, there's like a certain flow to it that you'll start kind of recognizing once you pay attention to it. Now, we're, of course, not advocating that you do everything in terms of thirds. Oh, no. That's not necessary. It's just sort of an artistic choice, and it happens to be uh, a technique that works a lot and uh, works very well in most cases, especially with people. Um, but you may want to just completely ignore the rule of thirds and go for something like dead center symmetry, mm -hmm. which is another compositional technique that people use very often. It creates very um, interesting pictures that immediately draw your eye because for some reason, 
humans are just attracted to symmetry, symmetry right? It really yes. just is, it's an appealing look um, in everything from our architecture to uh, other humans, right? Mm -hmm. So we beauty is sort of defined by people with uh, beautiful symmetrical features. Um, and even things as I, I mentioned this uh, very recently when I was looking for a Christmas tree, uh, you don't want the one that has like, you know, disfigured leaves on one side. Yeah. You want one that's nice and triangular and, sim and symmetrical. Yeah, exactly. Um, it just looks more appealing. It's sort of like it's within us. It's it's sort of innate that we, we tend to gravitate towards things that are symmetrical. And when you incorporate that into your photographs, it just works. It's embedded into your DNA. That's and there's right. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> it's just something we're all going to have to live with. But um, some examples of uh, symmetrical things that we've probably seen a bunch of times uh, sort of any kind of um, architecture photography uh -huh. is, you know, big on symmetry, obviously. Yep. You have, like, pillars and, and walkways and, uh, like, brick patterns, mm -hmm. honestly. Any kind of, like, pattern. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's one thing that's great about sort of man-made things is that they provide lots of opportunities for interesting visual elements that happen to be symmetrical. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look back throughout history uh, you've got things like you know thousands of years ago the pyramids perfectly symmetrical down to the you know last down to brick. the last inch <laughs> um, you go forward and you got like the way the Roman Empire was constructed everything perfectly symmetrical uh, and a lot of that stuff lasts to this day partially because it was just so perfectly yeah. constructed I mean honestly like railways it's just like all of those beams are like perfectly like in line with each other like mm -hmm. the little wooden screw and like the screws and everything that hold everything together it's all symmetrical and when you sort of superimpose not superimpose but contrast that against sort of the randomness of nature it creates a really uh, interesting visual element that um, we as humans are just sort of innately attracted to. Yeah, I mean, like, think about, again, like nature. Like, when something is, like, symmetrical, it's going to stand out to you. <laughs> so what are some kind of examples of uh, symmetrical things that you can take pictures of besides architecture? Like, what about a portrait? Um, well, basically, you, your, your face makes up something symmetrical. Basically, right. your eye distance is pretty symmetrical. Um, and it also makes, like, the triangle shape with your nose. Mm-hmm. So that's another shape. Um, now, but having like uh, what we just mentioned in the rule of thirds thing that most portraits aren't straight on right down the middle. But in this case, that might be something you want to go for. And it can create something very visually appealing by having a face dead center looking right at down the barrel of the camera. Yep. Maybe you could do like a half light, you know, a side light and uh, only illuminate one side. And while the lighting isn't symmetrical, the face is. Yeah, so it gives you a really interesting depth. look. Yep. Um, another thing you could do is use a ring light if you were going to frame up a portrait that way. Mm -hmm. And you'd get symmetry on both sides, and you get those beautiful catch lights, two circles in each light. Yep. Looking pretty cool. Um, so portraits you can shoot that way. Lots of elements of nature you can shoot that way, whether you think about it or not. Reflections, for example. Yep, right? that's so basically you've got a perfect... If you've got a big body of water, right, like a lake, yep. and you can get a reflection of the stuff that's above the lake, and you see it below in the water, a beautiful reflection. Yeah, it's a perfect mirror. That's a nice little mirror right there. That's symmetry right there that exists in nature. Mm -hmm. um, plenty of things in nature have a symmetrical shape to them. Leaves, trees, animals. Yeah. All kinds of things, that structures that animals create themselves. There's nothing more symmetrical than the uh, cells of a beehive, right? So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's a pattern right there. And all of those sort of geometric elements that we sort of take for granted on an everyday basis, if you go out there and you sort of seek those things out, uh, you'll be amazed at how much stuff that you find and what interesting photographs they can actually create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything to add, my friend, Nikolai? No, you pretty much said <laughs> I'm, I'm starting there. to go on a rant because I've had a little bit of coffee and I'm <laughs> feeling good. I got a it's nice decaf. big salad. It is decaf, but I, I caffeinated sufficiently before this podcast. Ah. And uh, I'm also feeling good because I had a nice big salad right after New Year's. We're recording this right after New Year's, and uh, I just finished up all of my high fat, high sugar, 
super high calorie yeah, garbage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so now uh, you're eating healthy stuff and no. actually getting energy from it. I actually, <laughs> I'm feeling good. Imagine that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> None of this uh, salad or coffee has alcohol in it. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> no recovery needed. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So, um, so there it is. Symmetry. Uh, think about it. Um, obviously, you don't want that to be your entire repertoire, but there's a lot that you can do with uh, symmetrical designs and uh, other elements in nature and also with man-made settings. Yep. And you can create a lot of really interesting things, uh, interesting images that people will just sort of naturally gravitate towards because, as we said, um, symmetry is just sort of innately appealing to us. My favorite's lampposts at night. Lamp posts at night do tell. Yeah, no, just they usually line them up very nicely, you know, on a street. And if you get like a street that's like not very busy. I see what you mean. And there's no cars. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks really cool. I think I have a picture of one of those right here in my little cheat sheet. In your little cheat sheet. <laughs> you know what? Um, I just figured I'd mention uh, there are a lot of things out there that are really cool symmetrical type photos that people have done to death. Um, but even if that's the case where there's, you know, uh, like you said, the lamp posts on either side, you know, shooting down Fifth Avenue on in New York City or oh, whatever. Yeah, shooting down train tracks. It's shooting all, down train. It's all been done a million and one times. Exactly. I've seen over this year, especially on Instagram, I've seen a zillion pictures of someone sitting in dead center on a pier as yeah. they look out into a lake. Perfectly symmetrical, very nice, a very appealing image, especially nice if horizon, you've got, you especially know. if you've got good color in the background. But it's been done a million times. Not to say you shouldn't do it. You should have one of those in your portfolio. Yeah. You know, they're cool. People like them. But uh, just keep in mind that that kind of stuff has been done many times. So uh, always be on the lookout for something different. Yeah, or put your own twist on it. <clears throat> put a twist on it. Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving on, the other main composition technique that is often cited when we're talking about um, when you're getting sort of your photography 101 class is uh, leading lines. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> now, I know you're a little bit more familiar in this because you do a lot of sort of uh, photography in interesting settings where there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, architectural elements that come into play. Yeah. So leading lines is probably something you're very familiar with. Yeah, I mean, leading lines basically is just what it says. It's lines that kind of lead you somewhere. So you want to kind of have a, a start a line in the foreground. You want to lead it to the background. Mm -hmm. So, And then you want to compose it in a way that it gives it kind of a sense of movement or maybe some kind of sense that you can walk down it or drive down it. Or you can just you can follow it easily with your eye in the picture. Yeah, I think sort of the idea with using leading lines is to take a static image and make it more interactive. Yeah. To sort of take you on a little journey through mm -hmm. through your photograph. So one of the things that's most commonly used, um, I've been seeing this a lot on Instagram as well, especially with uh, Sony recently, has been doing a lot of pictures as though you're just going on an adventure with your camera. Mm -hmm. And almost every one of those images that I see is like the camera sitting on a road and you, then you see the road curving into the distance or yeah. you know some other kind of element that uh, leads you out into the great unknown Ad adventure awaits when you're following a leading yeah. line because <laughs> if it's just a straight line then you know you kind of know where it's going true but if it's twisty and turning but if what if you can't see the end of that line mm, oh. if it's foggy at the end or Ooh. there's like mountains at the end or something like that so not only can leading lines um, sort of lead you in a, on an adventure, they can also lead you to something very specific. So if you have a subject who's at the end of one of those leading lines... It's like, oh, hey, surprise. It's, it's taken you from the area where you began, the beginning of that line, and led you toward your subject. Yes. And especially if you have numerous lines converging, so like you mentioned the train track thing before, mm -hmm. you start with those lines at the bottom and usually yeah, like in nice the corners, and wide, right? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's wide at the bottom corners and then it goes, you and get that perspective, right? Yep. That sort of keystone perspective and it leads toward your subject right in the middle and it leads your focus right into that very specific spot. So it, yep. it, it trains your eye to look at a very specific spot and not get distracted by the other elements in the picture. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you can use pretty much anything as a leading line. You know, roads you mentioned. Yep, Little roads. pathways. Uh, fences are really cool. Streams. Yeah, um, water bodies, rivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, buildings, of course, have plenty of lines incorporated. Lot, any man-made object, really, is going to have straight lines built into it. And a lot of symmetry things you can lead, lead into leading lines, too. Like, again, lampposts, they bleed somewhere, right? Right. Mm-hmm. A string of lights, like those, like the old school, like bulbs that come on like a string. Uh huh. That can lead you somewhere, you know. Absolutely. Um, and another thing. Escalators. Escalators are great. I see a lot Stairways. of city photographers do that. Yep. Like in the subways and stuff. Um, and another great thing about leading lines is not only can they sort of focus your attention on a part of the, on uh, the part of the image. But they can also create a sense of movement throughout the image. Yes. So it leads you on a journey. It focuses your attention. And it also can create a sense of motion, um, especially if you've got uh, lines that are leading from one side to the other, sort of as if you were reading. Yeah. You know, so if you've got that fence that goes across, you can put someone at the end of that fence and it feels like they've walked across that frame and you're on the journey with them. Mm -hmm. Or if you have them on the other side, it feels like they've just begun to go on that journey. Yes. And, and you're going to take that journey And I believe you mentioned this before. Um, <laughs> it depends also where you're culturally from, too, on where something starts, right? True. Um, generally speaking, people don't really think of this, but if you're here in the uh, U.S. of A., you generally start looking at almost anything, especially if it has any kind of text or mm -hmm. other kind of uh elements like that you start from the left and work your way to the right top to bottom right and that would indicate start finish start on the left finish on the right yep um in other cultures not particularly sure which ones but you would start from the right and work your way to the left and you may start from the top and work your way down uh, especially in Ang asian languages yeah um like the scrolls rather than what we do which is go horizontal lines so Consider the target audience that you're going with or where you where you live or what kind of language your uh, intended eye is going to be speaking and consider their sort of, um, I don't know, their learned way of viewing the world. Their culture, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. So rather than left to right, left to right, left to right, it could be... Uh, right to left, up to down. Right. Yep, exactly. Something to think about. Yeah, something, again, that could really make your stuff stand out from someone else's. Yep. Okay, so um, another compositional technique, which is not really a technique per se, but more of uh, a concept that you want to integrate into all your photographs is balance. Mm. Uh, making sure that you have uh, equal weight on different element on different parts of your photograph so that it doesn't feel empty on one on one end or it doesn't feel like it's unfinished yeah. you know what i mean yeah so it's not necessarily symmetry but for example if you have a portrait and that person is situated on one of the third lines on one side of the picture and to the right of them they have nothing but empty space yeah maybe they're looking off into the distance or maybe it's just empty space and that space ends up feeling like it's uh, like there's something missing. Yeah, like your 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 brain's telling you that there should be more there, but there's not. Yeah, like I've seen some really nice portraits shot in a field of wheat, you know, with beautiful mm -hmm. sunshine, uh, you know, golden hour sunshine coming through. Nice color, really nice portrait, but all there is is a line of wheat. Yeah, you know, it, it, <laughs> there's there's nothing there to sort of balance out the very stark, uh, contrasty image of this person, you know, they're just, they're taking up all of the visual weight in yeah. that image. And there's nothing to sort of balance it out and give it a little bit more, I don't know, a little more of a natural feel. Mm. Of course, again, if that's what you're going for, great. Um, usually unbalanced images will give you a sense of uh, tension, you know, a little sense of anxiety. Which um, is mostly my work, so. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine if that's what you're going for. If you want something to feel a bit more natural, having something to balance out whatever your subject is, which is, of course, going to be the most, um, the most, I don't know. Thank you for retrieving my remote. The remote. <laughs> That's why I was losing my place because I dropped my remote. Yeah. But you've got something very uh, visually stark in your image and you want to just sort of balance it out with something else. And there's lots of ways you can do that. Um, 
reflections are one. Mm-hmm. You know, that sort of goes applies to the symmetry rule as well, but you can use that to help balance out very sort of top heavy landscapes. Yeah, so it's not just em- like an empty body of water or just like yeah, at the bottom. Right. Um in areas where there is lots of symmetry, you can also have balance where you have very visually interesting things on one side and other very visually interesting things on the other side. So it's not like a mirror image, but each one of those sides has enough visual weight to carry its own so that you just don't have one part of your image that's completely overwhelming and the other side of the image that's dull and boring. Yeah. Um, And then you can also use background elements to sort of balance things out. Like I mentioned with that field of wheat, uh, it would be nice to have maybe just a blurry, out-of-focus farmhouse in the background in that field of wheat. Or a scarecrow. Or a scarecrow. (laughs) Or maybe you situate the sun over there or some nice fluffy clouds. There's just something, a little extra element to give your image some balance rather than having everything um, very heavy on one One side side, or on one portion of your photograph. Uh, Just to give things a little bit more of a, I don't know, just a feeling that everything's all right with the world. A little, little zen, a little balance. There you little, go. A little yin and yang. Exactly. Exactly. You gotta have. <laughs> you gotta have good with the evil. Yes. And have evil with the good. And we've got plenty of that in spades. <laughs> um, we've got more than more than enough. We, we've got more <laughs> than enough evil to uh, to pass around. So, um, one other thing that is definitely a sort of technique in composition is framing. Mm. Now, there's the regular framing within your viewfinder. Um, You've got a three by two aspect ratio space to work with, and you can frame within that. But when you have a frame within a frame, that gives gives your picture something extra. So what kind of examples can you think of for that? Basically using like tree branches and like the ground with like a nice opening with your subject in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Um, You can use, let's see what else. What's another good example? I like was chain link fences. Yeah, fences are great for that. Um, architecture always works great, right? So yeah, a lot of architecture has like, you know. Doorways, mm-hmm, arches, windows. windows. Basically what you want to do is sort of create a frame that focuses your attention on your subject. And your subject might be a landscape, mm-hmm. but you're looking at that landscape through the slats of an old fence. And... It just gives you something not only in the foreground to give your entire image depth, but it also sort of focuses the eyes on the area that you want them to look at. So if there's something specific that uh, really catches your eye, having another element of that setting uh, create an artificial frame uh, really does... uh, provide give you a really interesting image and it almost always works yeah and then also if you can't get it right in camera and you feel like there's something just a little extra you need there's tons of post-process stuff you can do as well like you can add vignettes even sometimes your lens will have Mm kind of like a vignette on it depending if you have a lens hood or something on it yes um you can honestly just probably put your hand around the lens and create your own vignette without you know doing Mm post-process but um there are a couple programs i use that add some interesting elements to my pictures because i like to make my pictures kind of look dirty and worn yeah so i have ones that kind of make the edges look like they've been like burnt right or you know they've been weathered um and it just makes the picture look that much more interesting let's take an example of some of your work like you've done a lot of horror photography in the recent past yeah and um what do you call it like abandoned buildings too okay so let's imagine that you have uh, a ghostly visage, you know, yeah. some some lady who's uh, obviously had her throat slashed and she's uh, a zombie now. Or, you know, something like that. Something along those lines. And she's haunting uh, a psychiatric hospital. Yeah. Now, you've got this ghost in the hallway and you could take a picture of this creepy incorporeal individual. Mm-hmm. Or you could take a picture of them through like a decaying wall. From the next room over. Or broken glass or from a broken door. broken glass, yeah. You know? I've done that. And you can focus the attention on this, you know, this creepy subject by incorporating something that's also creepy yeah. and it, creates a frame that really, you know, makes that subject pop. Mm-hmm. And also brings you into the brings you into the image, like brings you into the setting. Brings you into the environment that yeah. the subject is in. 
Exactly. So um, another example is uh, Nick and I were walking uh, back from a trade show and we saw a busted up old piano in some you know abandoned construction site. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a hole punched in the fence and I took the picture of the busted up old piano through the hole in the fence and that just added, added something extra because yep. you've got graffiti on that fence. You've got the texture of the wood and then you've got all that stuff in the background uh, and then the subject of the uh, piano itself so it just gave you a really cool visual, uh, you know, image that you wouldn't have been the same if I had just taken it yeah. on its own, it added, which I did. It added and I liked extra the, flavor. Yeah, and I liked the the one with the extra flavor more mm -hmm. for sure. Now that being said, you don't want to go around uh, framing everything that you do with some kind of natural or man-made element because that'll get tiresome. Yeah, and I mean, like uh, <clears throat> something with no frame can, it, you know gets into your head that it's an image that it's like a, a snapshot almost yes that's so if true. you wanted if you wanted to feel like a candid or a snapshot it's like you wouldn't necessarily put a frame on it because it just doesn't make it doesn't really make sense if right. it's a snapshot i think yeah i agree you that i'm trying to if say if you're looking at a picture that has intentional framing in it you get the idea that the photographer has composed this in a way so that they're eliciting something from yeah. you. Like they did it, it was done on purpose rather than you know a spur of the moment. Exactly. Um, but that can be something that uh, really, I don't know, just. <laughs> did I stump you? I, I, no, I don't know how many other ways to say it looks good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just something <laughs> that you. My vocabulary is starting to trip up on itself. It's just something that you know, it, like it, it clicks in your head. Yep. That it makes sense. Yep. So or if it doesn't make sense, it clicks in your head that it doesn't make sense. So definitely try that kind of stuff. And uh, wherever you go, look around for places where you can, you know, you re really have to kind of contort your body a lot of times to, to frame something in an interesting way. Yeah. Uh, you have to get down on your knee. You have to lie on the ground. You might have to get on a, a step ladder. Yeah. Who knows? Um, of course, that is also true with most types of photography, but sometimes you just gotta get that right angle to get the frame perfect. Yeah, and another way to like look at it too, it's like, it's subliminal. It's like sometimes you don't even notice it's happening, but if you ever have to like double take, like a look at, like to look at something, like you have to double take, mm. it's like that's usually telling you that something's standing out, you yeah. know? That's giving you like, that's like your, your mind giving you a clue that like this is something interesting that maybe I should capture. Yeah, and the good thing now is with digital, you can capture it different ways mm -hmm. you know you don't have to only do the one that you framed up nicely uh just get the regular snapshot see what you like better yep um all right so another thing uh which is sort of not necessarily a technique but something that you might want to consider when you're composing your images is your foreground and your background mm -hmm. so uh something i learned many years ago while watching bob ross do his paintings <laughs> on pbs was that Creating the illusion of depth is really important if you want to have visually stimulating images. Yes. Um, what he would do is he would start with a background, and he would put it's in all these little, white. He'd put in these little happy trees and you know little flowers and grass and all this other kind of stuff, and then he'd just paint right over it. Yeah. You know, he'd put other things over it. And you're like, why are you doing that? No, it's like you ruined that beautiful uh, waterfall was, that you put back there. Yeah, it's like there's such a beautiful waterfall. But he wouldn't obscure the entire thing just enough so that you could see it in the background and you would get the illusion of depth. And then he would create foreground elements. And with and every... Like, what are you doing? With it's like every, you're ruining the picture. But you would see it <laughs> later on, right? So it's the same thing with photography is the more layers you have, the more depth that you can um, that you can see and it really does bring your viewer into the image. It helps to bring them into the environment, like just the same thing with environmental framing, mm -hmm. having foreground, um, not necessarily framing foreground, but just, I don't know, let's use that field of wheat thing again, right? <laughs> Have a few strands of wheat sticking like, up in the yeah, foreground. Yeah, blocking your view a little bit. Completely out of focus, but just enough so that, hey, you're in the wheat field with that model now. Yep. You know, for a roll in the hay, as they <laughs> say. <laughs> like taking a picture of like a landscape. It's like have a couple tree branches in the, you know, in the front and then, you know, the forest and then the mountains in the background. Yeah. Yeah. And consider that background as well. So like you've considered your foreground, you've considered your subject. Now consider that background and make sure that you don't have elements that are 
uh, being obstructive in any way. They're not sticking out of your subject's head. Yeah. Uh, they're not. You want to give them antlers. They're not creating <laughs> unnecessary visual weight on one side of the image. Like if you have, uh, you're taking a picture of someone by the seashore. You don't want to have a big friggin' lighthouse on the other side of the image that's completely in focus. Yeah, you know, and it's like, oh, I want to look at the lighthouse now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You want to make sure that your background is balanced and is not um, overtaking the subject of your pictures. Yes. So, always remember when you're composing that there are lots of different elements that you should consider, and when you take a more sort of thoughtful approach to composing things, I think in general you're going to be more satisfied with your results. Yeah. Um, from beginning to end, you know, it, rather than going out there and just firing off a zillion shots and then sorting through it to find keepers, if you take your time to compose, uh, you'll find yourself with a lot more keepers and you're going to have a better time doing it. Yeah, like I can't tell you the amount of times where I've like shot the same thing like, I don't know, five different times, like just to have like different kind of little, like little different kinds of like exposure adjustments and stuff on it. Mm -hmm. And then you literally sit there for an hour on your computer looking at these five pictures and trying to figure out which one you like the best. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's better at that point just to have one picture to work with because there's not a huge difference between them. And learning composition also uh, really, it really shows you how important it is if you don't use like high end equipment. You know, you can go out there and you can buy a, a $5,000 system. You get the newest full-frame camera. You get a, a big, you know, honking lens, zoom lens yeah. with a 2.8 steady aperture. And you're just like, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to kill get, it now. Yeah, I'm going to get great pictures. But in the end, it's really not the gear. It's your skill in, as a photographer and how much practice and how much care and thought you put into it. And you'll have much more visually appealing images if you really take your time to uh, compose and think about what your end product is going to be. Yeah, I mean, like, think about what you want to accomplish, right? Yeah, I mean, if you go on, again, if you go on YouTube, you'll see that a lot of professional photographers take these challenges where they get handed like a little Hello Kitty, like 4.3 megapixel <laughs> camera that costs 50 bucks. Yep. And they, the challenge is to go out there and get, you know, a great picture and mm -hmm. they freaking kill it with that little Hello Kitty camera. <laughs> I have to write this down, by the way. We need to carry more Hello Kitty cameras. I, didn't we carry them at one point? We may have, but uh, there's never enough Hello Kitty cameras in stock. No. So I mean, I'll have to make sure that we uh, find the new vendor for Hello we Kitty. We need like Paw Patrol ones too. Paw Patrol? Is that not done? It's I'm not, not a Paw yet. Patrol fan. No? No. It's not. No. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know the big kids shows right now. So. Uh, my kids are into Teen Titans Go. Uh, Adventure Time is over, so that's uh, but done I didn't really with. consider like a kid kid. I'm talking like little kids. <sighs> oh, boy. I know there was like Peppa Pig was big at one point. I don't know if that's still big. Yeah. My son's turning five, so I've exited that territory. Wow. Yeah. All right. You let me know when you have kids, and then you can bring me up to speed. It's not happening. <laughs> so anyway, some people are just not meant to have kids, and I'm I'm one of them. <laughs> you should think you're wasting all that photography talent that you could be used uh, using kids. to spend. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. No, it's all, all right. you. All right, you can handle. I'll that. litter your Facebook feed with I'll pictures of my of my spawn. I'll stick with my uh, my deranged psychopaths in uh, haunted houses. Excellent. <laughs> all right, so uh, everybody, when you're uh, out there doing your photography thing, uh, keep your composition in mind. Uh, again, you don't have to follow these rules because they're not say, rules. Everything we talked about, it's like the number one rule of photography is there is no rules. <laughs> right. uh, you really, it's all subjective. If you want to do rules of thirds, go for it. If you don't, you want to create a little tension in your photography, do that. Yeah. You know, if you want to uh, do- Sometimes the rule of thirds will cause tension. Mm -hmm. And you don't want that, so you don't use the rule of thirds on that. <laughs> rule of thirds is a great guideline. It's like yeah, it's it, that's exactly what it is. It's a guide. It's not yep. something you need to follow every single time. Nope. Um, symmetry, something that you can see, something that you can seek out if you want. Look for things that are symmetrical. Try it. Do it on man-made elements. Do it on natural elements. Do it on people. See what you like. You're gonna develop your style. But symmetry is just one of those techniques that keep it in mind. You know, if you uh, are taking a picture of a landscape, maybe wait a little while to get some sunshine going so you get a nicer reflection off the lake. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Keep symmetry in mind. Just um, go shoot. Leading lines. 
check, you know, look at your surroundings. If yeah. you see those lines out there, see, think about how you can use them to your advantage. You don't have to, but think about it. Yeah, exactly. If if you have the time to sit there and like think about what you're trying to take a picture of, like you know, if it's not like a thing where it's like you know you have to capture it right away because the sun's gonna set in like ten minutes. You mm -hmm. know, if you have time to compose and like look at what you want to shoot first before you do it, you're gonna get great shots. Like basically, almost like you know, kind of a combination of the both is street photography. You know, you a lot of street photographers will find a scene, an interesting scene that they like. They'll set up and then basically wait for something to happen in that scene, whether it be like a bird flying by and eating some like food off the ground, mm -hmm. or if it's like it's just you know an interesting person walking through the frame. It's like a, it's a combination of both of trying to get the composition right and your scene right. Using patience is something that uh, really that's in the photography. Word we forgot to mention. Yeah, um, and that's the main thing when it comes to composition is that you can go out there and you can fire off a million shots and you can be like, well, I'm done with this location, <laughs> time to move on. Or you can take your time and wait for the right light and you can wait for the right subject to come into the frame. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I hear and see from uh, people who do birding right bird mm -hmm. photography they will sit there for hours waiting for a hawk to perch on a specific <laughs> branch uh waiting for it to regurgitate something into their nest <laughs> right and they want to capture that very specific moment of that happening or the uh spreading their wings and flying off and when they nail that shot after hours and hours it's of waiting an accomplishment it's an accomplishment to them and they will let you know about it that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> listen that's it's not an easy feat it's not an easy shot to get and that's why i think they're like so like yeah but when you nail that shot yeah you're proud of it mm -hmm. you know and you you appreciate all the forethought that went into it and you're not going to have to sift through a bunch of garbage that you just shot because you had the ability to do so. Yep. You know, so composition is really, um, it's not only the techniques, it's not only the innate eye that you have for the art, it's also the patience and the uh, thoughtfulness that you want to put into your work. Mm-hmm. And um, it some, also comes along with editing, too. It's like there's some times where I can sit and edit a picture for like, half hour 45 minutes and just like it's not nothing is connecting to me yeah you just scrap so, the whole thing not even that sometimes you'll just like want to rush it and just finish it yep and then post it and then you just like eh, you know it was like an eh, an okay picture but yeah. then if you just like you walk away from it for a bit mm -hmm. and then come back and it's like oh yeah it's like if i crop this this and this and then you know that'll me and then it makes it look a million times better you're happy that you actually took the time to figure out what you wanted to do with that image because you kind of felt like there was something there like you took it for a reason yeah and then it just wasn't working out at that moment in time you walked away you came back and you fixed it sometimes i know that you really like doing post-processing for me sometimes it can be the most frustrating experience because i'll spend like like you said like a half an hour tweaking <laughs> little things and doing all this stuff and it's not connecting and i'm like ah oh, the hell with this and i'll just hit a preset and it works. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes that's what happens. And I'm just like, why did I waste all my time when I could have just hit the uh, the preset in Lightroom and it would have been fine? It's just how it works sometimes, unfortunately. Uh, well, just the, the lesson there is take some care with your photography. It's it, a lot of the times it's more work than uh, you plan than you plan on, do. but usually in the end, when, you, when you put in that work, it pays off yes. for sure. So uh, use your patience, think about all those uh, composition techniques, and definitely your photography will grow as a result and you'll be a much happier uh, photographer down the line. Yes. I guarantee. <laughs> Something you want to print out and post on your, on your wall. Yeah. All right, so speaking of post, until next time, this is uh, Nick and, and, Nikolai. and Nikolai from Camera Academy. And uh, until next time, we'll fix it in post. All right. All so right. See you all later. Bye.